2 Corinthians, sigh of relief, 12. <sighs> Finally, 2 Corinthians 12. I think we dug a pretty deep hole in 2 Corinthians 11. I'd have to go back. It'd be interesting to go back. I could look this up on Sermon Audio to find out when we started 2 Corinthians 11. Because I, I said, we're going to be a long time, 2 Corinthians 11. And we were a long time there. But hopefully it was interesting. Hopefully that we learned something. I learned something. And I hope that you did as well. That's the point of Sunday school. Is to learn so we could be taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 12, there's more to learn. We're not done. This is, um, got two more chapters in 2 Corinthians. So let's start praying now because in another year I'll need another book to go to in Sunday school. So 2 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> I have it up on the screen, but I want you to look in your Bible. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 1, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Uh, let me ask you a question. In your opinion, are there still things that God has yet to reveal? Yeah. I don't think we know everything out of the Bible. I think, I think the revelations are here in the Bible. But I don't think... I, I don't think anybody knows it all. I think as we approach the, the culmination of what's in this book, I think people's eyes are going to be open. I think God's people are going to go, ah, that's what that meant. Because I don't think we know everything that is meant yet from Scripture. I do, I do not believe in special revelation, I don't believe that there are revelations outside of the scriptures. So I, not for a second do I believe that. But when I, when I decided years ago to go on this trip that God was going to take me on to, to learn and relearn, I then realized that there was a lot more that I didn't know versus what I did know. So I know that in my life, I'm not done learning, and I don't want to be done in this lifetime. Because the joy, the joy of finding something in Scripture doesn't compare to anything in this world. It, it does not compare to it. And, you know, the pleasures of this, of this life the, the Bible says, are for a season. They're very fleeting. And then once the pleasures, whatever pleasure that is, once you have gotten that, it's over and done with. But when you receive something from God, when you get a blessing from God, when you see something in the Bible you never saw before, it only gets better after that. Because what you just learned is the basement of what God's going to build on top of that. Just think of it that way. Once you find something new in the Bible, that, and that is really just the very beginning of greater things that God has yet to show you. And so, um, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord as long as you're breathing and seeing and able to read the Bible and hear the Bible. Uh, don't ever... Quit learning something new from God's Word. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Paul's very mysterious in this passage. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Now he's going to say this again. What he means by that is, did I know this person in real life? I met him at a church or in the street or at, he bought a tent from me or what? Did I know this person this way or 
Did I know this person from some revelation that God gave me in my mind? Did I meet this person in a vision? And so there's, there's, to me, several mysteries here. Did Paul meet this person as you and I meet people? Or did he meet him in a vision? Remember, Peter had the dream, the sheet lowered, and he saw the unclean uh, animals, and he didn't know that he was seeing Cornelius. Cornelius had a vision that God was going to send somebody. He didn't understand it was going to be Peter, but he had this vision thing, and he met these two met up in the vision, and then when they met in real life, they're going, I know you, I know you. So how did Paul meet this person? And again, here's another, here's another one on top of it. Was Paul, in fact, speaking of himself? Or was he speaking of somebody else? So let's read it. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard what kind of words? Okay, those of you who would say, uh, I speak this heavenly prayer language, and it's the angel, it's the, it's the language that they speak in heaven, and God gives it to me here. Is that possible? No, because those words are unspeakable. Okay, which things the Holy Ghost uttereth with words that cannot be uttered. If God said that it was unspeakable and could not be uttered, that means that it is unspeakable and cannot be uttered. We can't say it. Okay, we can't do it. There are things, dogs cannot talk the way we talk. Okay. Uh, they could, did you hear about the guy that called the fire department to his house because his fire alarm was going off? Did you hear about that guy? This is not a joke. It's funny, but it's not a joke. He called the fire department. His fire alarm was going off. He got up, called the fire department out. They came to his house, full turnout gear, everything, and went through the house, no smoke, no fire, nothing. Checked his smoke alarms. They were working fine. He had a parrot, and the parrot was making the smoke alarm sound. I would have had parrot for lunch had that happened to me, okay? <laughs> That's a true story. Now you know the rest of the story. Anyway, uh, he heard unspeakable words in heaven which is not lawful for a man to utter. For of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. So, was this Paul? Because some say it was. This is Paul referring to himself in third person. Or, was this somebody that Paul met that heard this? And he uses this story uh, to talk about the revelations given to him, he, he, he touches on that in verse 7, but we're uh, quite a bit away from getting to verse 7. Uh, of such a one, verse 5, will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Paul's a good guy. I like Paul. Because at that at last Sunday school, we talked about uh, the previous chapter. We covered a lot of verses in one Sunday, but it was all basically of all the times Paul got beat up. And Paul said, that's where my honor is. My bruises, my stripes, uh, all the scars that he, that he bears in his body. Um, the marks, he calls them, 
of serving God, he wears them with honor. And um, so he does not glory in himself. God took that out of him. And then on top of it, God put a thorn in his flesh. And um, I'm going to ask you later what that thorn was. But let's back up a little bit. He talks about the third heaven. Such an one, in verse 2, such an one caught up to, to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, verse 3, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words of which it is not lawful for a man uh, to utter. So the question du jour is, what is the third heaven? What is the third heaven? Is it the sequel to the first two heavens? Is it God's third attempt at creating paradise because the first two didn't work out so well? Or what is it? What, so what is, the third, what is the third heaven and where is the third heaven? Is the questions I will put to you. Go. That's a good answer. It's a good answer. It's where God dwells. Okay, that's what it is. Where is it? Come on, Cubby, you're a cop. You know everything. You know where everybody lives. Okay? Where is it? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. With a paradise. No, no, paradise. I get it. Okay? Um, paradise is where Jesus set the captives free to. He set them all free, um, the ones that were in Abraham's bosom. He went down, when he died, he went and preached to the captives, the ones who were in comfort, who had died before Christ died, who died in faith. John the Baptist, you would assume John the Baptist would be there with his head intact. Um, John the Baptist would be there, Moses no? Well, that's interesting. Never thought about that. How is it Moses and Elijah were in heaven already? Anyway, I've never thought about that before. It's interesting. But anyway, Jesus went and set the captives free, and now they went up to the third heaven. And it is where God dwells, and we're going to touch on that. Um, and what are the other two heavens? Is the third heaven a sequel? Is it the finished product of what God tried the first two times? Or what? What is that? So let's study that. We're going to go back to the beginning, Genesis 1. Turn your Bible there. It's one of those things that if you believe Genesis 1, you won't have a problem with any of this. If you don't, then to, to me, things just don't make sense. I'm going to talk a little physics astrophysics uh, in this teach a little bit about the universe uh, the heavens there's more than one and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that and um, what what they in you know what what are part of that the the physicists the astrophysicists and so on admit that they theorize that the observable universe may not very well be the whole of the universe. Uh, before the Hubble telescope, before that, we were very limited on what we could observe with the best, most powerful telescopes. Uh, some of the best places to put telescopes are, there's one in Hawaii on top of Mount Kilauea because it's at a place where it's on a mountaintop or close to it and the air is thin because telescopes and what you're seeing of the universe is hard to look at with all of the atmosphere, humidity, Humidity blocks our view, pollutants block our view, and so on. And so we have a problem seeing through that. 
There's one in the Chilean desert. Uh, can't remember what the name of the desert is, but it's the most arid, dry place on the whole planet. And they put an observatory there, a big telescope, because there's almost no humidity in the air, to, and it's high up, high altitude, and there's one in, I think, was it New Mexico or Arizona? One that the Vatican calls Lucifer? Are you kidding me? The, there's a Vatican observatory and a telescope they called Lucifer. It's true. Look it up. It's on the Internet. Look it up. It's on the Internet. But it, to them, see, all these guys, all these priests at the Vatican, they all speak Latin. Okay? And the word Lucifer means light bearer. So to them, it's a nickname. And I think that they do not recognize the fact that that's the devil's name, Lucifer. So they just, I don't know if it's a joke to them or what, but they have nicknamed this telescope Lucifer. Uh, but it's in an arid area of the country. And uh, because, like I said, humidity and pollutants and dust and clouds and everything like that tend to obscure our view of the heavens. So before Hubble, we didn't have a really good view of things that were very far away. When we put Hubble up, the first time we put Hubble up, who remembers what, when they first looked through it, what did they see? When they, the first time we looked through the Hubble Space Telescope, what did we see? Who remembers? A great big giant blur. Somebody had one job to do before they sent that telescope up to space, and that was to make sure that we could actually see through the lens. And they didn't do it. And they got up there, and they looked through it, expecting this fantastic view of the stars, and it was blurry. And it was a problem that could have been fixed and should have been fixed before it ever went up into space and somebody just didn't do their job. Seems to, that seems to run well at NASA. Okay? So they sent, uh, if you remember, I don't remember, I think it was Challenger, one of them, went up to, it wasn't Challenger, it would have been one after that. They went up to fix it. They grabbed, they, the space shuttle went up, grabbed it, and then astronauts had all these different parts to take it to fix it. They upgraded the computer, they upgraded a lot of things, and once they fixed it, they went, wow. So there are, there are images from Hubble that come back to us now that everybody sees it, that they just go, and tears, even lost people who don't believe in God, tears come to their eyes. These are, these are fantastic views. But what we've realized was that the observable universe is a lot farther away than we thought, and we are positive that we are not even seeing the very edge of space, of the universe. So it's probably actually bigger than what we even understand now, which fits the Bible, and I'll show you that as we move along. So, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I want you to notice the word heaven is singular. Paul just said that there was one that went to the third heaven. Okay? Which Cubby says, and he's right, that's where God's throne is, that's where God dwells. But, understand this, God did not create his own dwelling place on day one of creation. He already dwelt there. Now, to understand God's dwelling place before the creation, don't even ask me. Because you're talking about something that is not just over our heads, it is immensely over our heads. We cannot even fathom, we cannot even fathom the nature of who God is. We can't understand things existing without linear time. We cannot 
possibly conceive that. So it's just way, way, way above our heads. But notice that, and the King James is the only one that gets this right. It's the only one that gets it right. Because the other translations pluralize heaven. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But it's not, again, it's not possible. God did not create his own dwelling place on day one of creation. He created the heaven and the earth. And we're going to see how God differentiates heaven and earth. So Genesis chapter 1, let me just keep reading Genesis 1 on down and we'll explain how the universe was formed. Because I think this is, I think it's interesting. I think it's something we need to know. I don't automatically just discredit something that science says. I don't immediately jump and say, well, those are scientists. They're all liars anyway. Not all scientists are liars. Okay? Not all of them are liars. Um, when I study DNA, and I see that DNA is a 100% match for the Bible... That means science is catching up to the Bible. The Bible's not catching up. We're not rewriting the Bible to make it fit science. The Bible was right. David had it nailed 3,000 years ago. And it wasn't until the 50s that science really got its first idea of what DNA, how it was shaped, how it was put together, how it worked. That didn't come about until the 50s. So science, in my knowledge, is catching up to the Bible. The Bible's right all the time. So, but when I hear things coming from the scientific community, I'm interested in it because I want to see what it is that we're finding out. And if it's really true, then I'll find it in the Bible. And when I see it in the Bible, I'm just going, this Bible, I don't say, wow. God's, catch, God's getting as smart as the scientists are. I don't say that. I say the scientists are catching up to God. They just don't realize it. Okay? So, uh, the earth, verse 2, the earth was without form and void. So, the earth itself, um, we don't understand the shape that it was in. It says it was without form and void. So no life on it, nothing existed on it. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That's easy to understand, isn't it? You ever go to the beach? You ever been to the beach? You ever been to the Atlantic or Pacific or the Gulf of Mexico? And you see the waves coming in. What is it that makes these waves coming in on the ocean? Nope. Wind. Wind blowing in across the surface of the water is what raises up those waves. Okay? If you go to the one of the Great Lakes, you have little bitty waves coming in on the lakes, right? That's because there's not as much water for the wind to blow across and to make those big Waves that you see, like if you go to the beach on the ocean. On the ocean, there's a lot of water because it takes a long time. But the wind blowing in, I feel like a weatherman. The wind coming in from the east, blowing across the top of the water. And that's what it's doing. The Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It's like the wind blowing across the top of the sea. Now, at this point... Everything is absolute darkness. No, no stars, nothing. And God said, let there be light. There is always a connection between light and even the physics of light. There's a connection between light and Jesus Christ and the gospel, and the word of God. So notice, the creation of light involves not pixie dust, not a magic potion. It involves God's speech. God's word is light. 
God himself is light. The Bible says that. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. That's 1 John. So, the spoken word of God is light. All right? Um, let me keep reading here. Let there be light, and there was light. Because if God says it, it is irresistible. When God speaks, there isn't a force anywhere that can stop it. So if God says, let there be light, then there's going to be light. Who remembers really a moment with some people, it's a progression, but with some people, there was a moment in your past where the light came on, literally, and you recognized you were lost, you were going to hell, and you needed the gospel, you needed Jesus Christ. Who remembers a moment when literally the light came on? Anybody? My sister? Pam? Pam? Okay, um, I don't remember the emotions, but I remember the night that I asked Jesus to be my Savior. Um, I remember that night. I don't remember, the, I was nine. I don't remember the thoughts that led up to that. But I do remember, I've told this story many times, I remember the, the moment, the day, and the thoughts leading up to me coming back to this Bible. I remember that because what happened, I am convinced of what happened on that day was God said, let there be light. And I mean instantly, in a moment, I could hear, I could hear in my spirit God's Holy Ghost saying, that Bible is right in everything it says, and you know it. And immediately, I accepted that, because that was light. Does that make sense to everybody? What, and this happens to people all over the world. Again, sometimes it is a process God speaking things, but then there's always a point at which you decide to surrender because you then come to realization, I've been fighting this all this time and I can't fight it anymore. Even that is a boom, a realization that you have to surrender. You have to, the war's over and you lost, okay? God won, he conquered you. So keep that in mind. Let there be light and there was light. Notice this, verse four, God saw the light that it was what? Good. Um, George Lucas, when he made the first Star Wars movie, a conscious decision was made to dress Darth Vader in all black and dress Luke Skywalker in all white. Okay? Because Lucas was a student of films and film history. And in American films, back in, the, back in the old days, back in the early John, Day, John Wayne days, the good guys all wore white, the bad guys all wore black. And that's still done in a lot of, a lot of movies. Universally, all over the world, light is good and darkness is evil. It's bad. And here you have the Bible, the very first day of creation, God is putting this idea out to mankind. We all know, everybody does, light's good, dark is evil. It's in movies, it's in all kinds of things. I, I don't, I'm not prepared to talk about that, but it's, it's everywhere. If you did the study, you'd see it. Be all because God saw the light that it was good. Light is always good. God then, watch this, he separated the light. God divided the light from the darkness. Now, keep in mind, we do not have a sun. 
We do not have a moon. We do not have stars yet. And yet, God is able to separate light from darkness. At this time, since we have no sun, moon, and stars, light has to have a source. What is the source of the light that God created on day one? Where is it coming from? Huh? His word. What he said. God himself is the source of that light. So, and God then immediately puts a clear line, a line of separation, a division between light and darkness. Okay? Now, it may be hard for us with measuring instruments to pinpoint the exact moment where, or an exact line where light ends and darkness begins, but we know it when we see it. We, if you are in a completely dark room, we are instantly able to recognize any source of light. Any of it. We're able to recognize it. If you were, if you were trapped in a cave, you know you're surrounded in darkness. I got to find a way out. What are you looking for? Any source of light. And God designed your eyes that they'll open up to further examine the darkness that you're in to allow more light into the sensors of your eyes just so that if there is a very faint light that before the lights went out, you couldn't see it anyway, but the longer you're in that cave, the better you're able to see that. When You remember when the miners came out, the 33 miners came out, they all were, all were wearing sunglasses. Why? Because it made them look cool? They'd been in a cave for 69 days, and the doctor said, their eyes are going to be dilated, and we need to give them sunglasses before they come out, or they'll be blinded. And they had to wear those sunglasses for, I don't know how long, days after they came out of that until their eyes adjusted to that. But anyway, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of things to make you think about stuff, all right? And here's, uh, God divided the light from the darkness, verse 5, and God called the light, what? Day. Now again, where is the exact moment that sunlight or daylight begins and darkness begins? And we always want to know this at deer season don't we why do we need to know this at deer season because state of missouri puts out issues a time a time when if we hear a shot after that time you're good if we hear a rifle shot before that time you're in trouble but according to the guys that are sitting out in the deer blinds it was light Right? Guys on the deer blinds might have a little bit of different opinion of what light is. It's, it's light. Or I wouldn't have seen him. It's light. Anyway. Uh, take, hold your place in Genesis. Take your Bible. Turn to John 1. John 1. I'm going to show you a, a connection. Old and New Testament. They always join together. They always meet at certain places. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. So every place in the Old Testament is always going to be mated with something in the New Testament. John chapter 1. Isn't it interesting? The first three words start out the same way the book of Genesis does. In the beginning. In the beginning was the word. Meaning the word did not, was not created at the beginning. The word already was. Okay, that's very important. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So God is light, and God is the Word. So what does that mean? The Word also is light. And the Bible says those exact words. The entrance of thy words give us light. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. All things are, were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the what? 
the light of men. The light shineth in darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of that. Now we have a capitalization of the letter L. What does that mean? It means it's referring to deity, Jesus in particular. He, uh, he, this, this, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Meaning, you can't believe until the light shines. You can't. You can't believe what you can't see. Okay? Santa Claus. You ever seen him? No. Can't believe what we can't see. Uh, bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. John the Baptist was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the, what kind of light? True light. Meaning, God is true, God is light, the word is true, and the word is light. It's all the same. Thy word is truth, Jesus said. Thy word is light, the Bible says. God is light. So they're all connected together. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You see what he's, see what he's connecting it to? He's connecting it to Genesis 1. God is the true light that lights every human being on this world. Romans 1 says that at some point, everybody had the knowledge of the truth. They knew who God was. But then, over time, they corrupted. So here is God, who is the light, and the Bible says that Jesus is the Son, not just S-O-N, but S-U-N. The Bible says the Lord, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. I like this one. I like this one. The sun is huge. A million earths could fit inside the sun. That's how big it is. So it has a lot of gravity, has a lot of density, and it has a lot of gravity. The astronomers tell us that the sun actually acts as a shield to the earth. Because any visiting chunk of rock flying into our system potentially would hit earth and destroy the whole planet if it weren't for the sun. Because then the sun shields us from this meteor because it draws it in by its gravity and it deflects it away from the earth. The Lord God is a sun and a shield, the Bible says. So I just like how science matches what the Bible says. The Bible's always right. Okay? Anyway, back to Genesis 1. So we have the light. Jesus is the light. God is the light. This is the light that's going to light every man that comes into the world. Verse 6, let, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. What do you mean by that? Let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and that's all he did. On the second day. In the evening and morning were the second day. That's all he did. Was divide waters from waters. Now, here's what I'm going to explain. Don't have a lot of time today. What time is it? Somebody needs to ring the bell and save everybody. From this science lesson. You thought you were out of this. And you got out of high school. But we all know that there's water. Number one, right under our feet. Right? Literally, water under our feet. We also know there's water on the, the surface of the earth, the face of the earth, all right? But we also, all right, let's go. If you were in college, you'd run out, okay? <laughs> you wouldn't stay for me to finish. 
<laughs> Bell rung, I'm out of here. We also know you go outside. Um, Donna and Kyle, I knew that. I was going to say Brad, but it's Brad L. They're down here because they're escaping the waters that are above the earth. Because there's a snowstorm moving in, northern Missouri, Iowa, and they're coming, and in Kansas now, and they would be going I-70 to Kansas into, right into Denver, but they have to go down south to escape it. So we know that there's water up here, and God divided that. There's water down here, and then there's water up here. And all of that water weighs a lot. So what is it, and we're going to study this next week, what is it that's holding all of that water up there? There's got to be something supporting all of that water up there. Okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll see it. We'll see it in the Bible. It's there. Okay? You just got to, you just got to believe the Bible. Right? So anyway. Uh, who believes in low pressure, low air pressure? Who believes in that? My bones believe in low air pressure, don't they? Our bones do. We know it's there. Father, this world fascinates me. And I thank you, God, that I'm a Christian. And I believe the Bible. And when I study the things that are in this world and how you made it, you made it with rules and laws of physics. You made it with these unchangeable things, Lord. And when I look in the Bible, it's all there. Because your word is what made everything. And it just fascinates me. Father, let, let my fascination be a blessing to someone today. Uh, Lord, if for no other reason, God, then we as Christians have a good and a valid reason why we believe the things we believe. We accept the Bible by faith. But that faith is not in ignorance. That faith is there to give us the evidence of things not seen. And Father, we believe the Bible. But then, Lord, when we learn about what you created, how you created it, we find that this world and its creation matches perfectly with your word. It is a double witness. And so, Father, teach us. We're never too old to learn something new. Never too old, dear God, to stop getting knowledge and understanding and wisdom from you. And so, Father, help us, dear God, to learn something new at least every day. And just blessing on your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.